We have been talking about selfishness. <clears throat> We've discussed how dangerous it is for the individual, how dangerous it is for society, and how very dangerous it is for the world as well. And then yesterday we explained the cause of selfishness and then the foundations on which selfishness stands. Today we would like to talk about how to get rid of selfishness. So we will be discussing the way to end selfishness. As far as stopping selfishness or ending selfishness, we can see that sometimes it ends by itself. Selfishness arises, runs its course, and then ends by itself. This kind of ending of selfishness has nothing to do with our ability, our skill, or knowledge. It just runs its natural course and then ends. But there is a different way of ending selfishness that is our own activity. We take some action, some skillful, wise action in order to end selfishness and then it disappears. And then there is a third up choice which is even better than the first two. This is to prevent selfishness, to not let selfishness be born, and then we don't have to put it out. This prevention of selfishness is even more cool and peaceful than having to get rid of it once it arises. But in the end, it's another way of ending selfishness. So we have, there are three ways of ending selfishness. One, it ends by itself. Two, it, we, we do something to stop it once it has arisen. And then three, we can prevent its arising in the, fourth, in the first place. We'd like to remind you about the new life. The old way of life, the old common way of life, is filled with selfishness. We'd like to remind you about the new life that is free of selfishness. We've been warning you about the dangers of the old life. And now we'd like to encourage you and ask you to face in the direction of new life, to take this as the goal of life, to take this as our purpose in life, to orientate ourselves towards the new life that is free of selfishness. The new life is the life in which selfishness has been extinguished, in which selfishness has been stopped. So the thing that we must always keep in mind, which we, must all, which we must never forget, is the heart of Buddhism. We must always keep the heart of Buddhism in mind. And this heart of Buddhism is very simply dukkha and the end of dukkha, the cessation, the extinction of dukkha or suffering. This cessation, the extinction of suffering, is what's most important. Suffering is all over the place. It's obvious and clear. The thing that we need to be particularly interested in is the extinction, the end, the cessation of pain and suffering, of tukkha. And the way to do this is to extinguish selfishness. This is the heart of Buddhism. It's very simple. The extinction of suffering by extinguishing selfishness. This is what we should always keep in mind. 
to express this heart of Buddhism a bit more concisely we can say that if there is attachment to things then there is suffering when there is no attachment to anything then there is no suffering we can try and express it even a little more concisely than this we can say if attachment then dukkha if no attachment no dukkha this is the heart of Buddhism the Buddha himself declared that I teach only tukkha and the complete extinction of tukkha this is all that the Buddha taught these things about birth and rebirth and future lives and past lives and things like that were taught way before the Buddha and these are is not these things are not what Buddhism is about these are unnecessary they're not there's something that we need not spend our time on the essential matter is merely this thing of dukkha and the end of dukkha we're born in this world and there is tukkha this is something we can all be very certain about and tukkha has a way of arising and there is a way to extinguish dukkha this has nothing to do with future lives or rebirth it has merely to do with this life right here this is what Buddhism is about this life here and now Tukha exists and there is the way that it arises and there is the way to extinguish it this is what we're interested in we even dare to say that no matter what your religion no matter what religion you claim to follow or you proclaim as your own we challenge you by saying that no matter what religion you hold dukkha arises in this way and it is extinguished in this way that's all there is to it this is the matter that we ask you to keep in mind to reflect on to to make this truth very clear bright and apparent in your minds in order to free your lives from tukkha no matter what religion you follow this is the essential matter of life this is the duty of life we'd like to talk about something that may be a bit difficult for you to understand but please listen carefully and try to understand what we're talking about there's a thing that is called the good or goodness or sometimes we talk about the best some people value this very highly and go so far as to claim as the good is God or goodness is God the highest thing we'd like to point out that this thing called goodness that good is the basis of attachment that if we cling to good like we generally do then it turns into selfishness this thing we call the good or the best we attach to it we cling to it this leads to us becoming good crazy or drunken drunk on good crazy about good we become infatuated with good we get lost in it sink into it and drowned in good and this becomes selfishness this goodness or the good the best is the base of attachment it becomes the basis and cause of selfishness and so we need to take a good look at this please reflect on this thing that you call 
good or goodness or the best. If we're not careful with it, it leads to attachment. We'd like to look at this carefully in order to be free of good, to be void of good, to no longer be trapped and enslaved by good. And so we'll look at this thing, the good. These words may go against your feelings. They may not sit very well with you because for most of us, this goodness is what we value the most. Whether goodness or better or the best, the utmost goodness, all of these fall under the sway of positivism positivism, which is the thing that just about everybody worships. Everybody is worshiping positivism and hating negativism. And so these words about the good and the best probably grate against your, your feelings and opinions. But for those who are interested in being free of suffering and free of selfishness. We must understand this business of positivism and negativism and learn to be free of them both, to no longer be trapped by them, to be empty of both positivism and negativism. We're not sure maybe these words are too strange for you to understand. But please try, if you can understand what it is we're talking about, if you can truly be free of positivism and negativism, then your lives will be empty of suffering and selfishness. So please, please give your full attention to this subject. In the world, in the ordinary world, they're only talking about, teaching about two things, positivism and negativism. They don't know anything more than this. They don't know anything beyond this. All they can talk about is positive and negative. And so worldlings, common ordinary people, are worshiping positivism. They're getting enslaved to it. They become infatuated with positivism and become enslaved and trapped by it. This has nothing to do with freedom. This is to be, this is very far from being liberated. Just to be get, to get free of what is low and evil, this is not to be really free. To to go to pass beyond evil and get to what is good and then get trapped and caught in good is not to be free. It is just slavery to the good. This is not liberation. For true liberation, we must go beyond evil and then go beyond good and even go beyond the best. Transcend all this in order to be above, beyond, both the positive and the negative. When there is still self, ego, the sense that I am, then the mind is enslaved to positivism and negativism. But when the mind drops this egoistic thinking, it transcends even the positive, even the best, and then there is liberation. When the mind is still trapped by dualistic pairs, by the pairs of opposites, by any of these pairs, then it is not free and empty. Whether it's the pair of positive and negative, or optimism and pessimism, or plus and minus, or any of these dualisms, then the mind is trapped and is not free. To be truly liberated, 
to be truly emancipated and saved, the mind must go beyond even the positive in order to be free. For those of you who have Christian backgrounds or Judeo-Christian backgrounds, we'd like you to think back to the most important teaching in the whole Bible, the most special and wonderful teaching, which is also the heart of Buddhism within the, the Christian Bible. Please remember the first teaching which God gave to Adam and Eve, which was the warning to not, do not eat from the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the first thing that God taught to man, to not eat this tree, eat the fruit of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when we know good, then we attach to it. When we know evil, then we attach to it. And then we become enslaved to good and evil. We become trapped by positivism and negativism. Right in the very first chapter of Genesis, there is this warning from God himself. Not, not indirectly through Jesus Christ, but directly from God. The very first teaching given to, to mankind. Whenever the child begins to know about good and evil, then attachment arises to these things, and then the child's mind is enslaved and trapped by these conditions. And it gets trapped within all the dualistic pairs. So if you're a if you come from a Christian background, please be a true Christian. Don't be just a pseudo-Christian. And practice this teaching which God gave at the very beginning to not attach to good and evil. Otherwise, you will die. It's pretty funny that this teaching is actually the only direct quote of God in the entire Bible, whether the New Testament or the Old Testament. This is the only place where God speaks directly to mankind. And the words are very simply, don't attach to good and evil. It's right there in the first chapter of Genesis. This is the only time God spoke directly to man. And still, Adam and Eve didn't believe it. And so they went and ate that fruit, and the result is what we call original sin. From that original sin arose death, spiritual death, which in Buddhism we call tukkha, suffering. From this original teaching, God warned about attaching to good and evil. If man were willing to listen to God's warning, we would just see that things are happening naturally according to the law of nature, the law of itapajayata. Things just happen according to causes and conditions. It's merely a natural process. And in that process, there is nothing that can actually be called a self. But when the idea of self arises, when this foolish illusion arises, then man begins to react to things according to our own feelings in, ba in terms of this self. And things that the self likes are classified as good. And things which the self dislikes are classified as evil. And so out of this illusion of self arises the mistaken understanding, the knowledge of good and evil. And from this attachment, life becomes trapped in all kinds of dualisms and, and suffering. But by just seeing that things are, are happening naturally, 
by realizing that there is no self, then this problem can be avoided and life will be free. This is the new life, seeing that there is no self and so we can be, a, the mind is above good and evil. Now let's look at our own lives, these lives that are attaching to both good and evil, which are trapped by this, this dualism. All of this happens because of the belief in self. This attachment to self is the basis of good and evil. This is the cause of good and evil. This is the fundamental source of the dualism of good and evil. Good and evil only have value to the self, to this illusion of self, but they have no real value in themselves. But when there is this idea of self, then what is pleasing to the self is judged to be good, and what is unpleasing or unpleasant is judged to be bad. It's merely that, just attachments arising from the attachment to self. And from this arises all the dualities, all the positivism and negativism, pessimism and optimism in which our lives are trapped. This is the old life. This is the life in which we suffer. We need to understand this thing we call life, this life which we take and attach to and turn into suffering. Really, all there is is just the five khandas, the five aggregates, which we discussed yesterday. All that life is is the functioning of these five khandas, the various khandas performing their duties. That is what life is and nothing more. But when ignorance leads to attachment, then we take these various khandas to be the self. And this illusion is what creates all the problems. In reality, it's just the natural functioning of these khandas. But the ignorant mind takes, for example, when the body performs its duty, then the mind says, I, say the body moves, the mind thinks, I move, I move. Or when there is a feeling in the mind, I feel, the ego feels, this is my feeling. Or when the, the mind performs the function of discrimination, I discriminate, the mind thinks, there is the illusion that I think or when there is knowing of the sense objects, there is the illusion that the ego, the self, knows. Really, it's just these, the natural functioning of these khandas. But as soon as the self comes in, when there is the, a self, the idea of self arises in terms of these five, these five functions, then this leads to further foolishness and stupidity. This basic stupidity of self grows into the attachments to good and evil, positive and negative, and all these other attachments which entraps life. So we need to look at and understand life and understand this thing that we call the self, this this illusion, this delusion that is imposed upon the five khandas. We'd like to stress this point about the attachment to the functioning of the five khandas, that this self-idea clings to these five functions, and this arises the idea of self. This all is happening because of ignorance, because of not understanding the way things really are. When there is this basic ignorance arising to the illusion of self, 
then this self is taken to be permanent. This temporary fleeting idea of self is clung to and taken to be something solid and permanent. And then from this, we don't, the mind or we don't see impermanence. Rather, we see permanence in things. And we don't see the unsatisfactoriness in things. We see them as satisfying. And we see all things as selves because of this fundamental ignorance. Instead of seeing the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not-self of phenomena, they are taken to be permanent, satisfying, beautiful, and selves. They're taken to be permanent little entities, individual entities. This is all arising from the fundamental ignorance of our own clinging to things as I and mine. But if the mind can begin to see things, see the working of the five khandhas as impermanent, unsatisfactory in non-self, then this chain, this process can be stopped and the mind can become free. This is what we will go into next. So this brings up three most important things that all of us need to understand completely and clearly. These we can call the three characteristics or three truths or three facts, whatever. These are three characteristics of the five khanda. And when they are characteristics of the khanda, the aggregates, then they are the characteristics or facts of life. The first characteristic is impermanence. The five khandas or life is always changing. It's flowing. Nothing stays still for even a moment. This is impermanence, this constant flux and flow. When things are always changing like this, they can't stay still. They can't maintain themselves in any state or form. Nothing can stay in one form. And this means that it is difficult to endure, difficult to endure or bear. And this is what is meant by dukkha. And when things are difficult to bear, impossible to stand up to, that means that there is no self, there is no real self that can stand up and stop that change. There is no self that can prevent that change, that can stand that dukkha. And this is the third characteristic, the characteristic of not self. There is no self in any way, shape, or form. So these are the three characteristics of the five khanda or of life that we all must know. Everything is changing, is impermanent. That change is very difficult to bear. And there is nothing which can stop it or control it. These are the ther three characteristics of life. Impermanence, anicca, suffer unsatisfactoriness, Tukka and not self, anatta. The first thing to, to observe, to realize, is that there is merely a process of cause and effect, a process of conditioning. And in that process, there is no self. All that is taking place is a series, a process of causes conditioning effects, causes leading to effects. Various things cooking up, conditioning, compounding other things. This is a, a process of flow that is taking place. And if we observe it carefully, we just see it as a natural process happening under the law of Itapajayata, the law of nature. And in all that, there is no self. 
There are merely these conditioned things, these phenomena arising and passing away. And in this process, further conditioning and cooking up other phenomena. And this process just goes on and on. But there is no self anywhere to be found. This is the first thing to realize. And then it is possible to realize the end of selfishness. If we look closely at life, if we look at this operation of the five khandhas, we'll see that life is just this flow, just this process of changing things, arising and passing away, arising and passing away. See that in the operation, the functioning of these five khandhas, there is just this process, this natural process, and that each of the five khandhas, each of these functions, is completely empty of self. There is no self in there. They're just natural functions. And these five functions which make up life, that is empty of self. If this is reflected on, contemplated, and seen most clearly, then the mind can be freed from this illusion that there is such a thing as a self. Merely close your eyes and observe. Stop thinking about it all, but just observe this process of change, this process of, thing, of these five khandhas arising to perform a function and then passing away. Observe this natural process and see that nowhere is there any self. It is merely natural things, natural functions and phenomena operating according to the law of nature. When this is seen, then the mind is freed of that delusion of self and it stops cooking up all these fantastic ideas about good and evil, beautiful and ugly, positive and negative, pessimism, optimism and pessimism. The mind that is, no lo is empty of self, that sees the emptiness of the five khandhas. This mind no longer cooks up all these delusions. It's no longer attached to all these deluded ideas, thoughts, and uh, feelings. And then the mind is free. So just close your eyes and observe this process, this empty, selfless process. The next thing is a little bit more difficult to understand, but please give, please give it your fullest attention. In the functioning of these five khanda, all of these empty, selfless khanda, in their functioning, one of the khandas in particular Sanya Khanda, the perception, recognition, discrimination aggregate. Sometimes the way this one works is it perceives things as selves. When this Khanda is working in this deluded way, in this ignorant way, then it gives rise to their perception, the classification of things as self. This this illusion of self is just this one function of the Sanya Khanda, and that's all. And when Sanya Khanda, sometimes it perceives itself as self. Sanya Khanda classifies Sanya Khanda as self or as myself. And then it, it discriminates or classifies the various other Khandas as selves or belonging to self, depending on which one is functioning in the circumstances. That's all. There are these five khandhas functioning. But Sanya Khanda, because of this illusion, goes and perceives self in the functioning of <clears throat> the individual khandhas, or sometimes takes life as a whole to be a self, and then projects selfhood on other external things. <coughs> But this is all arising out of ignorance. So the only thing that can be done, the thing that we must do, 
is to wisen up, to bring wisdom into the operation of this sanyakanda, to stop perceiving things as self, to develop the wisdom and understanding that things are not self. And then this can correct the functioning of sanyakanda so that this illusion is no longer applied to the five khandas or to life. So the way to extinguish or destroy selfishness is to get rid of this attachment to things as self. To see that each of the five khandas are neither self, that they do not belong to self, that, they do, that in them there is no selfhood or anything of that sort. To see that the five khandas are completely empty of self. This will destroy the illusion of self and that in turn will destroy selfishness. This is very simple fundamental principle. The way to get rid of selfishness is to get rid of this illusion of selfhood. And this is why we study the five khandas in order to see that they are merely natural functions which are free of any self. This is a fundamental principle which you must try very hard to understand and then see, realize, observe it in, in nature, in life. Another thing which would be wise to observe is that as soon as we talk about extinguishing selfishness, just about everybody starts to complain that I can't do that. That's beyond me. If I were, I can't live without selfishness. Just about everybody reacts in this way. And then when we talk about extinguishing the belief in self, then people really complain. They complain that it's impossible, that they can't do it, and they become afraid. Because just about everybody is so attached to this idea of self that they think by extinguishing this that they would die. And so everybody becomes afraid of this, these words, this teaching. And the more attached to good, to goodness that someone is, the more afraid they are. The more lost and attached and enslaved to things they value, the more afraid they are of this truth. And so they complain and they try not to pay attention and they argue and all of those things. This is something that happens with everyone and so it's worth observing. In the, the Buddhist texts, it says that the devas, the, the divine beings, the heavenly lives, are the most afraid of not-self. The better that life is, the better one's life is, the higher, more happy and exalted one's life is, the more one is afraid of not-self. The different ideas about heavenly beings and so forth, about divine lives, these are the ones that are most afraid because their lives are so nice, so beautiful, that they're so good, that they become very attached to this goodness. And that, may, that just leads to being afraid. The better off we are, the more good we have, the more attached to it we become. And this leads to fear. This is a problem that it, we must correct because it makes it impossible for us to lead our lives in a way that is new life. This, all this goodness that just inspires and incites attachment makes it impossible to live a new life, to realize, to end selfishness. So this is a problem to, to look at and realize and then correct. Another fact that we need to consider is this thing we call the instinct of self, this fundamental instinct 
that of there being a self. This instinct is very powerful and it is difficult to overcome it. And for many of us it would seem impossible. But there is one way we can deal with it. And this is that if this instinct is operating, then be very careful with it, keep it under control so that there is this self, but don't let it be selfish. If you still value this instinct of self, then at least don't let it become selfish. Keep it under control. Remember that in truth, this instinct is not really true. It's a bit foolish and ignorant. It serves the purpose of survival, of allowing life to survival, but it's not actually true. If we can use this understanding to keep this instinct under control so it doesn't become defilement, doesn't lead to greed, anger, confusion, and so forth, then it can become a self that is not selfish. This is a technique that we can all use this to see to use that instinct of self that is and not let it become selfishness and then life can continue there will we will survive we will continue living but not selfishly and by doing this then we can begin to apply the knowledge that comes from concentration, insight, meditation. By using the powers of concentration and insight, it will become possible to see the reality of this instinct. If we can keep that instinct under control enough to have a peaceful and calm enough life to practice meditation, then there will, it will be possible for the, uh, the knowledge to arise from the practice of concentration and insight that that self is just a creation of the mind. It's just a conditioned thing, just a phenomena, an idea arising and passing away in the mind. And then with, if it, this knowledge can be developed, then the mind can be completely freed of selfishness. This instinct of self can follow two paths. It can either take the path of enlightenment or bodhi, or it can take the path of gilesa, of defilement. If the instincts are controlled and kept so that they are correct, especially this instinct of self. It is, if it is kept from being selfish, then it will stay correct and it will follow the path of bodhi, of awakening or enlightenment. And then in doing so, it is possible to eventually realize the truth that all things are not self. We have to prevent this, the instincts from following the lower path, the path of gilesa. Because these instincts are all, have a tendency to just follow the things which entice it, which lure it. All the delicious, attractive, exciting, beautiful, enjoyable things in the world. These are always lure, luring the instincts towards defilement, towards selfishness. So there is this tendency to take things as self, to attach and to become selfish. So we must be very careful with the instincts to maintain them in a way that is correct so that they follow the path of awakening. If they go on this low path, that's just the common, cheap, ordinary life. Many people are willing to surrender to the instincts and allow them to become defiled. 
many people aren't willing to put forth the effort to control the instincts and live in the higher way. Most people are willing, they, they give up in surrender and let the instincts chase after beautiful, delicious, attractive, fun things. But if life is to be correct and freed from selfishness, these instincts must be controlled and led along the path of Bodhi, of awakening. Before we end today's talk, we'd like to remind you of a metaphor which we used a few days ago. This is a metaphor that describes the life in which there is self, the life of attachment, of clinging to self. In this life, it's like there is a rope around one's neck, pulling one upward. And there is another rope around our feet, pulling us downward. And then there is a fire scorching us in the belly, the fire of greed, the fire of hatred, burning and scorching our gut. Please reflect on this this metaphor of the life of attachment, the life of self and selfishness. There's a, there's a noose around the neck pulling upward and another rope around the feet pulling one downward. And in the middle are these very painful fires of lust and hatred burning one's, one's guts. If you reflect on this metaphor of the life of attachment and selfishness, you begin to see the pain inherent in such a life, in this old life. And when you begin to see the pain of the life of attachment, you'll start to think about, you'll seriously consider removing this illusion of self, getting rid of the self and selfishness. So please use this metaphor and reflect upon it and see the life of attachments, see selfish life as it truly is. The rope around the neck, another around the feet, pulling one apart, and the fires of lust and hatred scorching one in the middle. And then you'll begin to have some genuine interest in a new life a life that is free of self and selfishness. We'll end today's talk with this, this metaphor because time is up.